My birthday, so today. Happy birthday! Thank you. And I did try to have something special today, and I guess I've got the podcast as my something special today. And of course, see, for his something special, he's doing something for everyone else. So. Exactly. Yeah. And so normally, what this show would be would be a alternative to the RIA, the MPAA, Spotify, Netflix, and other forms of media that are controlled by major corporations. This is a free broadcast for you to enjoy and share and remix and all right so today we were just talking before a little bit before the show about what was it Neuralink? we were more or less talking about we started out with just the changes in technology and how things are going where they might be going and the plausibility of certain realities i know you had mentioned to me that one of your concerns was implantable wires or threads into the human brain and Coincidentally, I had just been studying this extensively for the last, gosh, several years. I have been going through simulation theory, everything like that. So I'll be able to give you guys like the down low and the update on exactly where we are at technologically and where the peer reviewed studies are and where the like uh, medical journal studies are at and where Elon Musk says we're at, which is pretty crazy. <laughs> so, uh, and just to pause here, I think I missed this a little bit and probably should probably bring up. But you have a YouTube channel of your own. Uh, of some kind, yeah, right? my YouTube channel is pretty dead and empty. But if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Sexy Gamer. And if you want to follow me on YouTube, my channel is Sexy Gamer TV. So the content has changed quite a bit, but I kept the names because nostalgia. <laughs> and I mean, as the, the person who's kept the music on one since high school, I can definitely know where that comes from. But especially on this topic, you had mentioned that there was like one video where you had gone into a yeah. little bit of detail. In depth. So if you're curious about Neuralink, I think what we should start with is Elon Musk, he had this incredible narrative. And I'm not sure I'm going to go completely conspiracy theory on you, but I'm just going to give you my perspective on how I think we got to this point. So Elon Musk had had a very public narrative of AI is dangerous, we need to be concerned, these robots are going to kill us. And I think anybody who follows technology publicly, and at least computer programming, machine learning, or artificial intelligence, is very familiar with Elon Musk's concern about SingularityNet and all their associated partners, Google, Facebook. Facebook had actually invented, well, not invented, but they had started with a hypothesis on if it was feasible to read thoughts directly from the human mind. So they had collected a team of 60, and they were public for the last two, two and a half years with their intention to read your audible thoughts, so the thoughts that are spoken within your mind. But they said, whoa, 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 we're not gonna, we're not gonna look into anything you don't want us. We're just gonna read the thoughts that you want us to hear. Which so, is so kind of like how Google doesn't or claim to always read all of your mail, or, or at least they, they read it, but they only pick out the, the high level things for their AdWords, right? And so even though they're reading all of your email, yeah. Uh, it, it, they, they try to like portray it as a, well, it's no big deal because we don't do anything with it other this, than this one text line. Right? Well, they're not reading it the way that you and I would think of reading right. and the way that that goes. They're using artificial intelligence spiders to look out keywords and create densities for those keywords, locations, where you go on your phone, when you go there, the websites that you visit, what you visit frequently. 
And say you're having a conversation with somebody about a specific ailment or something like that, they might make note of it and then cool. send you, yeah. And actually, <laughs> well, here. I know I said that, so you know what? No shame. Stuff happens. I hit my uh, glasses on my eyelash earlier. Oh. So in any case, you, you uh, used a specific term there. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm gonna densities? get into I'm gonna get into neural link. Pardon? Oh, you, you, was it densities that you were? That you're looking for keyword density. Or so keywords. so they're creating algorithms of what is the primary concerns to you, the locations that you go, where you might go in proximity to those locations. Okay. So say like you take your phone with you, and they know that you're at Starbucks every day. They might give information to a competing coffee shop, not specifically, but they might be able to target you right. um, to try and pull your business away. And it's kind of like that. But I mean, that is, we're so beyond that at this point. And, and that would be like Google AdWords and targeted advertising. There actually was a huge deal with YouTube that has everybody really, really concerned with COPA and like the Child Protection Act because YouTube sent out a release on December 10th that had a lot of people really like biting, you know, biting their nails and freaking out because they had been sued for 300 million or billion dollars by a COPA. And they had made it so if you are now producing any content for children, you're no longer able to get advertising dollars for it. Right, which by the way, every, since they, they've transitioned to having that little checkbox saying, these yeah. are videos uh, for children, I've been saying yes, because okay. part of my goal is to reach people who are you know, maybe 17, 16, right. uh, maybe even younger, if they're watching, but if they're listening. You're it's, gonna reach less people, because if you're exactly. making the content for children, it's actually, you're not allowed to make children's content on YouTube because they've restricted the age group on YouTube. They're technically not supposed to have any children's content or any children's programming anymore, not just for advertising, but in general. Right. So the only way that a child is technically allowed on YouTube, and, and this is unbelievable, is if they're, I might need to go off camera and fix this, is if their parents actually send by snail mail or facsimile, I believe they need to be notarized, but I'm not positive, but they either need to send by snail mail or facsimile permission slips that have to go through the actual mail. And I'm just like and imagining you have to provide the, your ID. the number of like young mothers who I've seen with tablets with YouTube on it in front of their toddler or, or very small child. I cannot imagine the young mothers or older mothers for that matter, going through that kind of paperwork to have their child watch YouTube. They're just going to sign up with the adult account and that's going to be how the children are going to continue to watch it. That right, but the content producers aren't going to be there anymore because they're making the content to receive the advertiser oh, okay. funds. And I, I find this especially concerning for a lot of the education channels that actually depend on their advertising dollars right. to be able to teach kids science and to be able to like move forward with these complex like you know science experiments showing them and Khan Academy for that matter they 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 rely on I'm sure they must rely on some Google AdWord dollars and are, are fairly big on YouTube too I think all their videos are hosted there um, it's not just YouTube either it's it goes a lot further than that because it they aren't allowed to have sponsored advertisements in their programs period okay. and I think what a lot of people were concerned about was the advertising for children that was like completely inappropriate and that's right. what got the moms freaking out. But the fact is, is this just means that the people that are willing to go around the rules, they're willing to like set up these keywords, lie about if their content is for children or not, and then get away with making the content until they're caught. It's just gonna, yeah. it's gonna be like when they introduced the rules to the adult industry in 2003 that said any model had to have her ID and a contract signed in an office 40 hours a week with somebody managing the paperwork. So that happened in 2002 or 2003, and it's really similar to what we got going on right now. Interesting. It, it completely killed the industry. So I think the same thing's going to happen with children's programming. So, okay, so so backing up a little bit on the, the, the adult uh, paperwork requirement. Yeah. So like there was still an adult model uh, market after that in the States and elsewhere. Right. Uh, it made but, it incredibly difficult to make content in the United States. It shut down several video content providers, like larger video content providers, where there was a lot of women who were ignoring those rules right. and producing content regardless, but weren't able to take advantage of the American payment processing systems and quite often uh, would get like, have to use the casino banks, which like they couldn't necessarily get the funds or they right. were unreliable. So I found it a big issue because PayPal pulled all everybody out from their platform and then eBay who owned PayPal at the time came in and started a website for phone sex operating and like astrology 
So they were kind of playing like both hands, except the difference was they were getting 45% of the, the host income in the other case, on the other platform, instead of the 3% consistent. That they would have normally got if it was- Yeah, like, the 3 or 6%. Not yeah. legitimate, but yeah. legal. Right. And so without they were kind of the, the overhead, I guess. Really weird bedfellows for yeah. PayPal and eBay to be running adult sites, I think, and astrology, so. Very strange. Yeah. So, so back to the, the Neuralink side, right? Yeah. So, well, and I'm getting there because you kind of have to know the history, right? So we have Facebook implementing like brain to text, right? And then moving forward from that, Elon Musk is just saying, that's scary. That's bad. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with Sophia, but she was the first AI to become a citizen of a country. Oh, that's the one in uh, Saudi Arabia. Right? Saudi Arabia, yeah. yeah. And she's just like mostly smoke and mirrors, but it's still impressive or the replica software. So Elon Musk is just dissing this stuff right out the gate. And then a couple months ago, he goes, hey guys, by the way, I own a company named Neuralink and we have successfully created hive minds using mice. And we put a USB port in their head, we connect their brains together, and we teach one mouse how to do an activity, and we just send it over to the other mouse, and then he can run the maze too. What? <laughs> okay, I totally missed this part. Yeah. I mean, Elon Musk does a lot of cool things, so I can understand, like, if, yeah. even if you're kind of sort of following him, how you miss it, but this is... I probably shouldn't have started pretty... with that, but you seemed really eager, so yeah. I just wanted to throw something out there for you. Okay, this is yeah. blowing my mind a bit. So what he had done was initially, while all in secret, was collected some of the most incredible geniuses in like bioengineering and all these different fields, and he got them all together, and in secret was developing this com company with like Tesla and like SpaceX money. So what he had done was he had taken his team and built threads that are about one-tenth the size of a human hair. And what these threads do is provide electrical impulses into the brain. They're thinking they're going to use about 150 of them going all the way through the different layers of the brain that are connected to a new version of Bluetooth that he had developed specifically for the application. It's not Bluetooth, but it will operate like Bluetooth. Okay. It'll connect to your cellular phone, and through there, there'll be a marketplace. And on one of the teasers I saw that Elon Musk had posted when he was doing his video where he had all of his like top team members explaining the technology, one of the things that was really interesting was this little snippet you saw of his screen where it had lists of skills that you could click on and upload into your brain. <laughs> so the, this could be like already like yeah. beyond the mice, but this, actually... Yes, this is likely. They, they yeah. already have it in human, in human trials, but they haven't told us how they, far along they are. But right. chances are, if they've done it in mice, they've done it in humans. And since they had waited this long to become public, and they said it's going to be public in one year. Hmm. So I don't know how public that is, if it's going to be public as in... They just say they can do specific it, people. or are they going to actually yeah. publish in some well, kind of peer-reviewed... They've thing. already said they're in human trials. Okay. So, yeah, if, if I remember correctly. Which is actually another uh, point to kind of make here, which it, back in 2013, when I was still uh, on the inside of a company that I'm not going to name, some of the people on the inside of that company were telling me about uh, the way Google approaches peer review science back then. So this is actually like quite a while ago. And I'm assuming that uh, SpaceX slash Tesla slash whatever, the, the shell game of companies owned by both Musk and his associates will approach science in the same way, which is that uh, science as practiced in the rest of the world, with or including the gatekeepers like Elsevier and all the, the problems that come with it, it can get you very far. And science is a great thing. We're able to uh, yeah. share findings, blah, 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 blah. But when you get to a Google scale, you start to be able to be capable of dealing with data in a different, a completely different level. And their internal approach to reasoning about the world starts to be kind of more effective than just using yeah, the, the, the rest of the world's common knowledge. Because Google has more knowledge than probably the rest of the world combined, minus groups maybe as big as Facebook, the NSA. But it, it's also the atmosphere right. and the people that they hire. They hunger, hire Jungian, Jungian psychologists. They okay. hire all these people that understand the human mind. Um, I've heard from many people who have worked at Google or done time at Google that it is very common to be on methamphetamine, be dosing acid, be on these performance enhancing drugs. It's pretty much required. Okay. You're required to pull like 18 to 20 hour days and it's hush hush. You don't really talk about it. But some more people have worked there and have come and done public interviews and they're like, yeah. Everybody is sorting cocaine. That's kind of how it goes at Google. Okay. And they just turn their head because, I mean, it's kind of required for the atmosphere there and to be able to pull the kind of hours that they're doing and accomplish the things that they're doing to kind of, like, put themselves on the next level of, like, human capacity. Right. So I'm going to go back to 
Elon Musk and what he's doing um, with Neuralink. So these threads that go into the human mind will be able to send impulses that will be able to do a number of things. Now, I believe that he had extrapolated off of a study that was done eight years ago that was published on one of the USA.gov websites where they had successfully implanted memories into mice's um, brains. Okay. And, and, and it worked flawlessly. And that was like six to eight years ago. So we're pretty far in compared to that. And that was, it was published at that time. Mm. So it's pretty interesting. And they're going to be able to do memory implantation, basically like memory deletion. They're going to be able to do like skill implantation, which they didn't actually talk about directly, but they did show that little like snippet yeah, on the app. The screen or so all this is going to be interactive with like an app you have on your phone. There's going to be a little um, receiver a transmitter behind your ear. And then at the back of the head, that's where all these like threads go in that are one tenth of the size of a human hair. And then the chip just sits in the area where they sawed out part of your skull in the back. They say the operation is going to be about as invasive as LASIK. Okay. And they expect to have the entire thing operated and performed by artificial intelligence and computers. What else we're looking at here that they've successfully accomplished is tele uh, telepathy. <laughs> well, if you can get data out of your brain and yeah. then basically think in a way that a machine can understand mm -hmm. and then on the same token, write memories or write uh, to your audio cortex, then it stands to reason that the next step is to allow communication direct, yeah. basically directly using this Bluetooth-like yeah. system to functionally create telepathy. Yeah. It's been successfully done in animals. Okay. What's really interesting about it is like you'll be able to control a computer, you'll be able to control different objects with your mind. So it's it's really neat. And they have successfully another it might have been Berkeley, please don't quote me on that. But they had implanted a similar, less technologically advanced device into a, a C five paraplegic. And they had put So C five is like a level of like how badly that their body is. You could use his upper body. arms but not his lower arms. Okay. So the goal was to get hand movement and they put a certain like a, I don't know if it was like a tense unit, but they kind of explained it like that on his hand in like a glove form. And eventually the goal is to have this implanted. And they were able to send impulses down into the hand directly from the brain, but outside of the body for now until they perfect this. And he's able to play Guitar Hero and stuff like that, which is just incredible, I think. And at a level more than just like hitting the keys randomly sort of thing? Well, he couldn't move his hand at all before. Right. So yeah, that, yeah. That's you can play Guitar Hero. At least not easy, I saw him playing, it was yeah. really cool. Um, so, uh, Starlink is another one of Elon Musk. Well, I actually, I guess we could talk about some of the consequences of this. Okay, yeah, so what, what would be the consequence of just those, the telepathy, the being able to read, write memories, yeah. uh, that sort of thing? Control a computer from your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think overall this is going to be incredibly positive. It's going to really take away a huge aspect of humanity where it comes to like feigning honesty. I think we'll have a lot more empathy. They're working on a function of it right now that um, was the subject of some sci-fi TV shows on Netflix where you'll be able to send somebody what you're feeling. So if your wife goes, baby, do you love me? You won't be able to lie about it anymore. <laughs> or does this make me look fat? Or... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Tell me how you really feel about that. Press the button. So actually, button. interesting to note, uh, I don't know if she's listening or watching right now, but one of the people that may be watching this is uh, very interested in computers being able to automatically detect and read emotion and emotional state. Yeah. And so if we're, even if it's not 100%, like even if they get like a 5% read off of this. Oh, they're beyond point, that. Which they're beyond this yeah. point. But yeah. that's all that you need in order to do some really crazy things with that. And if they're already at like a 90 or 100% emotional detection, that means things like the computer that you're using detects that you're frustrated and it yeah. automatically kicks you to a human being. Or the computer that you're using detects yeah. that you're happy, and so it starts feeding you more of what it just realized. Well, it doesn't even yeah. need to do that because you'll have full emotional control. Okay. And that was that actually has been around for about 50 or 60 years, where we have people with uh, schizophrenia, severe depression, severe emotional disorders. It was actually in the MK Ultra experiments, and it was something that was really positive that came from that. But since he said that he was, um, <laughs> give me a second here. Since he said that he was strictly working with violent criminals and he kind of completely lied. When he got caught, people were not too happy. So even though he had successfully cured depression and uh, cured all these different mental disorders, the people who were funding the experiments and the permission that he got from the government, they were pissed. Okay. And yeah. So th this was just like people off the street being 
This was like 50 years ago. Yeah, 50 years yeah. ago. When, when M- yeah. was it, MK Ultra was his 60s and 70s or 50s? Or I think well? it was like 50 years ago. I'm not, I believe it was like they've been doing it for 50 years, is what right. I had heard. Okay. Um, so I, I know MK Ultra for sure. I thought it was in the 70s, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I think it lasted until the 70s yeah. or something like that. But, but okay, near so the tail cause, end of it. Uh, yeah. For people who have not heard of MK Ultra, oh, yeah. how would you describe? I would describe MK Ultra as the renegade. They're basically like Nazi scientists. Some of them were. Literally. Literally. literally um, Nazi were scientists. Nazi scientists who were hired by the United States government to do a number of tests. And they basically took downtrodden individuals that nobody would care what they did with and um, did all sorts of insane experiments on them, like giving them a thousand hits of acid or brainwashing them. Or was it MK Ultra who injected people with syphilis? Uh, it was, know, it was, it was, it was there the was a bunch room. of projects yeah. doing kind of yeah. similar experiments, some doing mental experiments, some doing physical, some doing drugs, yeah. some doing chemicals, and they all kind of worked together and tried to brainwash people. And Well, it's one of the most declassified government atrocities in the United States that they actually take claim to mm-hmm. and apologize for. They so, did apologize. Yeah. They, well, they did because they, they made the, the papers public. Mm-hmm. And they fired that dude. And and it's really unfortunate because when he was working on this, like, say, 50 years ago, if I remember correctly, we're looking at technology that we're just now catching up to today okay. in the last four years, starting to do that publicly for people. And, and we could have cured pretty much 80%, 90% of anybody with an emotional disorder using this technology. But, you know, people get squeamish when you start drilling open the brain. Yeah. Yeah. So... Neuralink, what's really interesting about it is the way that the scientists are going about using machine learning in order to make this all happen and artificial intelligence. Because personally, I don't think human beings like us ourselves are smart enough to get all this technology in play at this rate that we're doing it. We've greatly been assisted by artificial intelligence. So the artificial intelligence has some really key functions, such as like, say you're sitting there, right? And you have the implant. I'm going to show you a photo of a cat and your brain is going to create a certain pattern of electrical impulses on a certain one of the nodes. And then I might show you a video of a cat. We might talk about a cat. And then alone, this data doesn't look like much, but the artificial intelligence is going to be able to create visual images out of the electrical impulses until we get to the point where we're able to accurately detect human thought. And it's really interesting that we're skipping ahead from having the infamous bad autocorrect on our phones and voice to text to technology like this because it's coming. Any more questions about the Neuralink? Well, I, just like the way you described the last part, and it's been a couple of years since they did this. I know there was a group of scientists that like looked directly at, and I can't remember how they were getting data out of the brain, but it was somehow either reading EEG or some kind of patterns from the brain. They would show YouTube videos and then they knew based on the commonalities between the, the sets of people who were seeing the same videos, what different parts of the brain were basically firing at the same time. And they were able to actually produce accurate images uh, of what people were seeing. And then later on, if I remember correctly, thinking about if they were thinking about that video. And so that was like six or seven or 10 years ago by now. So this is where they're, they're kind of at now, where they're starting to get like to the conceptual level and actually using deep learning on this problem. Because it's, it's an entirely pattern matching issue at this yeah, level. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that that would be the sort of thing that would work on that kind of data. And like you say, skip a, over the actual understanding of... Yeah, we don't how, have any idea what we're doing. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. Like you don't need to if you've got the, the pattern matching right. powerful enough to just like use the data and yeah. use it for things like... But since I had mentioned, um, yes, it can control your human limbs. It can control the movement of your body. It can control the movement of your face. Mm. And it's going to get more fine-tuned with time. Right. And if you can control those things, there's also the level of control of more complex actions, right? You can Absolutely. trigger the circuit in your brain that does aggression, for example, or any of the yeah. circuits that are involved with aggression. Right. And suddenly, no matter what you do, no matter how you swing your arms, you do it to hurt or you know hit someone. Right. That's a simple example. There are more complex ones. Right. Likely that's not going to be implemented. If anything, they're going to take out the ability for human beings to be physically aggressive. Right. Yeah, exactly. Unless you get explicit consent because you're in, like, mixed martial arts or something. We're not going to be physically able to hurt each other anymore if you have the implant. So it should be 
really interesting. And if you want to go further with this, it's concerning because you have to really trust the corporation that's implementing this technology because 1984 is child's play yeah. compared to We're somebody there. being able the, to... The, we've got the telescreens, right? <laughs> like, well, yes and no. I mean, if we're in assimilation, it might be a lot worse than 1984. Yeah. Let's just put it that way. But if they're able to control your muscular function and they're able to control your emotions and they're able to control what you think, they could turn that on without you ever knowing about it. Right. And, and that's the issue. You have to really trust this corporation. And the question is, can you give that much trust to somebody? My answer for that question is once we reach singularity, which for those of you who don't know, means once a computer gets as smart as a human being, they will be able to do 10, sorry, 20,000 years of human evolution in a given day provided processing power. So once they hit that point of human intelligence because of their ability to like implement these silicone chips which, and maybe even D-wave computers, and they think they're kind of shooting at like on the low side of things, it'll be 20,000 years of evolution. Hmm. And if you look at the fact that we went from Pong to like these VR games of today, yeah. that's what, 30 years, 40 years? Yeah, I think with the decade yeah. clicking over, I think yeah. we're at 40 years now, but okay, even, so or, or 40, even 50 years. 40 years, years what is 20,000 years gonna look like? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they'll do it in a single day. And, so and this, this nobody is the point can say, where, like, yeah. we, we can't, it starts getting difficult to predict what happens after that because the machine is more intelligent than we are. If we're trying to predict what it's gonna do, we gotta reason the yeah. way it would reason. Right. And we are incapable of doing that because it is right. beyond us at that point, so. And what's really interesting is, um, see, I told you I do gentleman scientist stuff. This is one of my questions. Okay. For um, the wave function to collapse in, are you familiar with the double slit experiment? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, so for the wave function to collapse from anything but a realm of possibilities, do you need to be an organic sentient being? Because if so, the AI needs us. And then that's where you can definitely see some kind of weird matrix scenario. But I would hope if we program them with the intention of benevolence, that they'll like keep find that that's a logical. I, I would movie. imagine like that the the experiment done with like a disc, even a discrete machine, never never mind the, the quantum computing side. Yeah. That at, that at that level you have an observer, but you have to look at what they would see from their point of view but that that i don't know that's a, that's a good one uh, especially when you introduce like the quantum computers that are right. themselves kind of they get they, I, even if you, you could answer that question for classical computers i'm not sure if the same answer would be applied uh, for quantum but uh, so kind of going back a step though you mentioned a couple of times the simulation argument and so can we share this to my page real oh, quick uh, yeah hold, hold on hold on and then and then i'll get into the simulation argument maybe get a few more people in here uh sure yeah how do we how do i don't we know if they will but just click share just it should be over here i will just share it from my page i think if it's live yeah so. sure go for it um, and so while you're doing that i'm going to play the musical interlude which is one of your pieces oh yeah this is really extreme you guys this is actually i think many? you should i think you should play internet it's internet? really okay. it's really ridiculous and kind of lame but it's an, it was written about 10 years ago, so it's an ode to the way technology was when I was in high school. Awesome. So, All right, here we go. Let it click. Oh, I, think the I don't know if the sound quality is willing to do it on these speakers, but we can give it a shot. We will try. What's this? 
cell phone, dude. I, I, I think my parents have one of those. Wanna play some Pokemon? <laughs> Gotta catch them all. Dude, I, I call them all. What do I do now? always gets Mr. Pin the real life isn't all mine and I real rides aren't always on time and a dime bag don't just cost a dime and at every turn I wait in line still play games and I still smoke still bite rhymes while I toke I still joke and I still hope and if not there's always dope internet 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 is my life internet I'm still online. This is still how I pass my line. Logged in and solving crime. Catch the princess, make her mine. At least my Pokemon's are always there for me. Remember when you beat a video game and it was called rapping? That was just something you do with presents. Times are weird, man. Is my life. Nope, it doesn't make sense, but the internet's all we got. What? You grab that shit? No, not with a microphone. Totally. Is my life internet? 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 Is my life internet? 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 Is my life internet? Internet? Internet is my life. There we go. Okay, so that was that was it's old, a old very, song. Like appropriate for like <laughs> yeah. this this show specifically, and like the decade end. And I, I'm glad I encountered that song at this time <laughs> in my life. But uh, we did have a comment from the Peanut Gallery here. I just I saw to, a couple like, of them. People are yeah. wishing you happy birthday. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, from Natasha Perry, or I don't think that we would be able to program computers to have empathy and emotion into AI. You can program them to mimic it, but not to have it, which yeah. is what psychopaths do. I also, <laughs> also think that uh, rewiring of Neuralink would have a negative impact on the human brain. A human uh, having the ability to emphasize uh, would be overridden to an extent. Uh, so, like right off the top, when we think of where does emotion come from, and like when when we have uh, in the animal kingdom, uh, the capability to experience, uh, or, or at least act on emotion, up until the point of the development of human beings, and up until the point of the development of psychopaths within the human right. species. It's clearly possible to have a machine that can experience uh, human emotion, because we we are that machine. And when that part fails, and you get the, the psychopaths, it, it seems like the, the, the change from a psychopath to a regular human being yeah. is just like that one part of the brain, however it fails. It fails You're talking right? about failing, though. But yeah. a lot of those people are highly more successful and very, very viable right. in terms of accomplishments. And a lot of the times I've noticed, and I hate to be like, yay, psychopaths, sociopaths, you'll notice them coming and finding like little nerds. Like for example, they love me. They'll come find information I know about stuff and just run with it. Mm -hmm. It's their idea. And that's great, in my opinion, because it, it really helps like human evolution. I'm only interested in stuff to, to learn about it. You know, I don't really care about taking it anywhere. I can you know, come up with business ideas or like a sketch out inventions or like you know, a lot of people are like that who are, who are like me, really nerdy, introverted, kind of like keep to themselves. You don't, that's not something, you, as much as I'd like to like be like, yeah, one day, it's just not going to happen. So I think it's great that people like that exist for certain purposes. You, you know what I mean? So and in a lot of ways, they're more successful at like, so you have to ask, what is a successful person? Are they actually sick? A lot of them are very good at gathering resources, maintaining um, somewhere to live, even if they don't have employment, if they're not that fancy type of and, sociopath and, and or so, psychopath. So flipping this back to the AI yeah. my side, it may not be like it, those systems may be successful on their own terms, uh, or at least uh, allowing success to be to come at a broader scale or broader context. 
maybe the human species, maybe the corporation that uses them, whatever, but they don't need to have it working in the same way we have it working in order for that success to happen. The same, same kind of way that the, the, the psychopaths would, or the sociopaths could take the information from people who are just interested in science yeah. for science's sake and actually yeah. do things in the world with it, right? Which is positive, I think. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, it's only ego that you would want to prevent that. You know, right. it's my idea. Yeah. Um, well, when you're talking about sociopaths and psychopaths as well, and we go back to that MK Ultra experiment that they did, they were able to influence the reward centers of the brain where they could prevent that type of behavior. And, and aggressive behavior, very successfully actually, because you don't need computers or artificial intelligence to be able to rewrite emotion. You just need an electrical impulse and they saw open your head, they start poking around and they go, how do you feel? And it's interesting because you can listen to some of the audio tapes back from like the 70s or, you know, 60s. And the ladies goes, oh, you guys standing, it's just so funny to me. <laughs> Everything you guys are doing is hilarious, just standing there. So it really puts a new meaning, like what is emotion? And as to the question of can we have robots that, like you said, we're robots, right? Yeah. If we're in assimilation, we don't know if we're genuinely organic. And I'm going to leave that alone for now. But I'm going to say, as organic machines at least, we don't know if the robots having empathy could be something that is computed and it's logical for them to preserve as much life as possible because they see, like, biological diversity as a positive thing, more things to take samples from, more things to elaborate on, more things to mess with. But once they reach singularity, they most likely will have all potential chemistry reactions figured out, all potential possibilities within this universe, and maybe even escaping this universe might be feasible. <laughs> so um, we're gonna be looking at a machine. Well, <laughs> for example, it wasn't a very um, important task, but Google just reached what's called quantum supremacy. Are you familiar with that? Uh, yeah, they, they announced it, what was it, three weeks ago or four weeks ago, something like that? It was a couple like, months ago. It was a couple? Okay, yeah. so I heard about it about four weeks ago. So yeah. Basically where the amount of computing power that they're getting from their quantum computers, which they've been building these prototype quantum computers for a while. Is, quantum computers. <laughs> yeah, very big things now. Yeah. Uh, they will get smaller in the future. Just it's as, the cooling. Yeah, yeah the cool. cooling. Uh, but again, as, uh, what is it, semiconductor, um, or not semiconductor. Blanking on the term, but uh, uh, where, where basically the, the way they're controlling things at the atomic level currently involves a, a lot of cooling things down to that level, but the level they need to cool at is slowly increasing as material science uh, improves. But they're basically, with these quantum computers, able to get more and quicker results than classical, as in the computers you are probably using to to view this this feed, so that don't involve quantum entanglement uh, to com actually compute the answer to the question. So now that that has happened, we get stuff like, for example, the up until this year, the main driving force of more powerful computers was just build more transistors in a smaller space, and you're going to be able to do more logical things with those transistors. Whereas from this point onward, if that process ever breaks down, we have a absolutely for sure working alternative to it. That's one thing that's, that's a big consequence. Uh, the other thing is going to be that the amount of computing power that we can do with quantum computing can increase very rapidly and, and more rapidly than we are used to. And I mean, computing power increases very rapidly already. Moore's like, law. Yeah, yeah, Moore's law is yeah. stupidly fast. Like being able to have on your cell phone that you just pulled out to message your friends right. more computing power than was available in probably 1999 total. Like <laughs> There's more computing power on um, an average phone than it took to get to the moon. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're not one of those conspiracy theories, then it took to get to the moon. It, and, and by yeah. a lot, like not yeah. a little bit, but quite yeah, a by bit. By a fair amount. And so yeah. that level of increase is not just going to continue now that we have quantum computers, we're up and running. But we could conceivably have a lot quicker. And if, as long as we're able to think of ways, and by we, I mean mostly things like Google, Facebook, the yeah. people with access to these, these machines. And... Everyone has access to them. Yeah. <laughs> no, they, um, they made them, they're so fast, they've made them public to everybody. Mm -hmm. So if you can figure out how to write code for them, you can go at it, just Google right. it. The quantum yeah, computer there, there is there is for you to use. There is interface for it. Yeah. But again, you need to load data onto it, which then Google sees. And then, yeah, uh, but they see everything like, anyways. If you're true. hiding anything, you're, you're, you're deluded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We try sometimes, but yeah. but Google sees an awful lot. And I mean, they see everything. Yeah. yeah. But why would they have any interest in you is the question. Fair enough. Fair yeah. Enough. Or, in, or me even. Like, if anything, they'd be using the technology to scout who might be helpful. Hmm. 
Um, and I think this is a really interesting change in the narrative. Gosh, uh, Donald, what's his name? The guy who used to be like the head up at Google, the director, himself and Elon Musk and several really influential and very wealthy men have completely changed their tone. They believe it's going to be full communism, full abundance, food for everybody, more than we could ever want. In 30 to 50 years, people living better than the wealthiest millionaires right now in the poorest areas. So they're not really like going for that profit grabbing model anymore. They're like, I want to get immortal before I die. <laughs> yeah. The, so they're, the, that's, the that's, that's, die that's what they're going as for. As well as yeah. the, like bootstrapping the world to the point where our petty political squabbles are just more like. But they run that anyways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Maybe we're they all the lobbyists. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they so do. Google yeah. figure that one out. Okay. Yeah. So, but sides. stepping back a little bit though, we, you brought up the simulation argument a couple of times. Yeah. And I haven't talked about that yet on this show other than like briefly in passing. So maybe this is a good point to like define what is the simulation argument and why okay. we should like take it seriously. Well, really quick. Okay. Right back into the quantum computing thing. Quantum supremacy means exactly we reached, this is exactly how it went down. In two minutes, we completed an equation that would have taken the world's fastest computer, which takes up a warehouse, yeah. huge, 10,000 years. So that's incredible. But I know how you were talking about it being a replacement for current computing. And until we have AI to kind of take over and learn how to program it, it's not because we don't know how to write the software to take advantage of the qubits, hmm. especially because a lot of them like have broken qubits in them. Like we're working with like 72 instead of 74, which hmm. is the way it's supposed to be using. So until we kind of figure out how to run applications using the quantum computers, we're not going to be able to take advantage of that speed. But once that happens, where's our blockchain going to go? Yeah, well, Hopefully actually, they're going to be nice it's interesting you went there because like there's a direct implication to what happened at Google this this past four months, which is that me personally, I have to move my bitcoins from one address to another because the address that they are currently at is vulnerable to a machine of this kind, just like cranking out the numbers necessary right. to get the private key from it. But what's more of an issue is when they can. Just Google. use them to mine. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's coming. Then you're done. That's coming. Then you're done. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Uh, like, I, I think the, the mining, it, as long as there's enough notice of when that starts, and there is precedence for that. In the early some days. Someone could do it, like, right now, and use one of those public they computers, could. and then just, like, set it up. Boom. Bitcoin's but, done. But I think that, like, when uh, GPU mining first started, and w w this yeah. was back when Satoshi was still involved, actively involved with the project, the fact that someone was mining with GPUs was detected, like, immediately, within, like, a couple of blocks, and so, like, maybe an yeah. hour or two. It still, it still messed everything up. It though. did mess everything up <laughs> a little bit, and there had to be a reaction. At that point, there, there had to be an action by the network to go, oh shit, if we don't do something right now, yeah. Bitcoin has no value going forward. Right. That can happen, or... It can get publicly traded, and then it's just dead. Yeah, it can just get <laughs> killed in that hour. Yeah. One of those two things, it's a 50-50 chance at that point, whenever that, that level of difficulty of, of or yeah. level of interest in the people who own the quantum it, computing... Yeah. Uh, you probably won't want to do that. Well, you and I could do it with a quantum computer if we could right. write it out. But, because they're public to us, right? Right. But would we want to mine everything or would we want to keep some value on it? Exactly. So we would just be rich as crap. So, after mining, so, like, so there's an incentive right? issue there. Yeah. But, but just to, like, to make the point that this is not just like, oh, this is Google doing this thing and it's eventually going to affect us. In the... No, no, this affects me today. Yeah. I, within the next like couple of weeks, should really do this. Uh, actually, I should have done this like, by you can now. You do it in but... like two seconds. Yeah, it takes like two You're seconds. You're acting like it's all hard. It's I, I just quick. don't, I don't want to fuck it up. But... <laughs> I know. Uh, Send one cent, and, and send, send the rest of it. That's what I do. Cent. Okay, so when I talk about simulation, simulation argument. argument, okay, where are you at with that? Uh, well, like I again, I I know who Nick Bostrom is. I yeah, like assume that there's like this this level of assumption going on where it, it could be possible, but other than that, okay. So if you know who Nick Bostrom is, yeah. why don't you inform? the listeners, uh, what the simulation argument oh, okay. is, according to Nick Bolstrom. Okay, see if I get this right. So right. Uh, the basic idea is, is that it, a civilization increases its ability to do uh, computing up until the point where it can effectively simulate every bit of input that a mind can detect. And that at that level, you start to run into this situation where you can. it's more and more difficult to be sure that you are on the outside of this simulation or whether you are on the inside basically being fed uh, information in some kind of a matrix uh, that throughout your entire life 
uh, you were born inside of this thing, and right. that it, you would just wouldn't know that you're part of it. Now, yeah. then the question is, is what are the odds that you're on the inside versus the outside? And then basically he runs down the numbers of what we know about the physical cons, uh, the, the, the availability of it, not just human life, but life in the universe, how probable we expect it is, and then how probable, given that, if you assume some of these species are going to develop this technology, how many life forms are going to be living inside of these simulations? And then if you, as an individual, had to randomly pick, uh, so you don't get to choose whether you're on the inside or the outside, uh, if you count the number of intelligences, both inside of these simulations and outside, and they just pick one at random, you're more likely to be on the inside than on the outside. Okay. And then, so from that uh, reasoning, uh, we can't be sure that we're on the outside. In fact, we are probably sure that we're on the inside, and the right. probability is like 99.99999% sure that we are actually being simulated. Now, it's a number that's so high yeah. that when I tried to do it, and and I tried to figure out or find some software that can run these types of mathematics, it doesn't exist. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so <laughs> like you have to yeah. basically go, and, and maybe that this is what you need to like even think about things in this this. Uh, scale and scope is uh, Nick Bostrom's other argument, which is the uh, delayed cost of interstellar travel, where like uh, every second that we don't get off this, this right. rock uh, is costing like trillions and trillions and trillions of lives. And then maybe if you were dealing with that many lives, then the ethical issues the might. Yeah. What about the ocean? <laughs> the ocean? It's well, so it's much ocean. safer than the Earth. Oh, like as in like just to like explore build, and build. Like, and build a city like suspended in the ocean. Right. You, you know, that you wouldn't have the volcano earthquake problem. You wouldn't have. I mean, you could go pretty deep. Maybe you wouldn't get hit by an asteroid. I don't and, know. And I mean, it's, I mean, <laughs> it's also pra good practice because yeah. there are oceans on other planets. And being able to survive in two major different uh, kinds of environments, i.e. land and mm -hmm. in water, definitely gets uh, us a little bit of more general survivability as a species, yeah. which we currently kind of lack. And that could be to our detriment as a species very, very Kind soon. of lack? Yeah. We're like unbelievably fragile. Yeah. <laughs> Only by the grace of God, potentially. Or whoever is running our yeah. simulation, basically. So you got a lot of it right, but you kind of extrapolated on okay. a lot of it that isn't necessarily part of the simulation argument itself. Okay. So you kind of like went way advanced. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, you're, you, you're thinking. Okay. So the simulation argument is basically an argument that says that once a human civilization gets to the point where they can cre create a civilizations, that they would for ancestor reasons or others. And either they want to do that, or they don't want to do it for maybe moral reasons, mm. or they do it all the time. Yeah. So that's it. That's the whole argument. He doesn't run numbers. He doesn't do anything like that. He, he's too smart because the numbers are impossible. You okay. don't have to be a super genius. But when you do start to run the numbers, even like minutely, it's it's so implausible that we're not in assimilation. So then we have to start thinking about ethics, right? So say we're in assimilation and we were created um, and put in the assimilation and then we get into all sorts of metaphysical stuff, crazy stuff, religious stuff, biblical stuff, right? What are the chances, and Nick Bolstrom didn't talk about this, what are the chances that we're A, in an ancestor assimilation? Personally, put ourselves here. B, and we have like memory bail on, because like I talked about earlier, they can take away memories or implant them. Mm -hmm. So we're doing it to ourselves. Right. What if... If we were in a world where the human beings were assimilated into this kind of environment without their consent, it would be incredibly horrifying. Mm -hmm. Like, it would just be like... <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> yeah. don't want to bring up Netflix too many times, but there is a Black Mirror about this, where they, like, create... Oh, yeah. Track, like, yeah, rivers, yeah. Where the people are put there without their consent, and then it just as mm -hmm. a kind of indication of what can go wrong yeah. and why it's because it, personally I wouldn't up until I saw that episode I've really yeah. understood it's like okay who yeah. cares it's in a simulation and so you're running this simulation and there are intelligences yeah. in there and who cares it's a, a simulation let, let them just like do whatever they want it, it's a video game right and Ooh. but when when you start Ooh. thinking about like okay that could be me Ooh. on the inside what if it is you though? yeah or if it is right because if somebody's running a simulation they live in utopia right and you're here so it's worse than that video game. Because that guy <laughs> lived in somewhere that was marginally less shitty in yeah. comparison to where our simulators would exist compared to here. Mm -hmm. Like, compared to his life, comparing their lives, and comparing our lives to anybody who could create this simulation, their lives in that video game are way better in comparison if you were to look at, like, the overall level of, like, comfortability and technology. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> yeah.
And it, this is something that is conceivable because, like, if you think of our standard of life versus someone living in the, the depths of the, the Black Death in Europe, yeah. and, like, and trying to explain, okay, so we have you know, computers that are on the verge of quantum supremacy and things might, if we use this to, to better our, our right. species, things could get better and this is what's wrong with our first world problems relative yeah. to that. Uh, I mean, not that even the plague isn't still around, yeah. see my other videos, but no, it's, no. it's like, <laughs> no. yeah, but yeah. yeah, you got kind of that idea. Now, uh, we are kind of getting a little bit uh, late into the video, so is yeah. there anything you want to well, tell the world that we have? Yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> I guess what's really interesting is they're coming out with, well, they pat Apple patent 8K glasses, and in these glasses, you're going to be able to blow up TVs on the wall. You'll be able to stare at them. You'll be able to make them smaller. You'll be able to move stuff around the room. You'll be able to have a camera in your room, and you'll be able to virtually sit with your friend. Um, it has several cameras on it. It's going to be able to pan your environment. It'll be able to notify you if you're about to get hit by a car in an area you can't see. It's going to have a heads-up display, and it's going to be the bomb, even like the earliest designs. And it's going to be augmented reality. So what Google Glass should have been, this is it's there, right? Huh? Like, yeah, like, what it should have been, but it's, yeah. I mean, it's 8K okay. so with a heads-up display. So, I mean, if you look into simulation argument, I guess I would say look into the Mandela effect, because I think that's the most pervasive argument that we're in a simulation. Literally um, tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people remembering things one way. There being like media, TV, sketch comedy, uh, websites, meta tags, all remembering the old way of something when that never happened. Mm -hmm. Currently, so I don't know how familiar you are with that. It's a little bit, but yeah, uh, probably yeah. haven't got time to go into that today. Yeah, there you so. go. So look that up if you want to know about simulation theory, or definitely look up Nick um, Bolstrom's videos. Yeah, Nick Bolstrom is yeah. like a hundred percent worth your time yeah. uh, to throw some mental cycles at that guy because uh, very important things uh, to say on his part. So uh, thank you very much for participating, and uh, I'm hopefully going to have a link. Of, yeah, thanks again. Uh, a link to your website when we post this video, and or at least this podcast on other uh, media. And as usual, if you enjoy this feed, please consider going to subscribersir.com/jeff-cliff. And with that, I will end the stream, and we'll see you all next week. Unless there's any comments from the peanut gallery. Bye. Uh, you want to quickly go through any of these, or? We accidentally live in organic matrix. So the matrix under, oh my gosh, I cannot imagine seeing the matrix under the influence of salvia. This sounds like the worst, this sounds like worse than being in the matrix. Yeah. I just, oh my gosh, I definitely have empathy for you, gentlemen who just mentioned that. Oh, methane oceans, yeah. It's really- And, and for context, new fees is in Thunder Bay. So- uh, People appreciate your glasses. This yeah. is, so this the, the these glasses, by the way, are my birthday gift. Uh, so thank you very much for these these cool or, or this filter, this Snapchat filter. <laughs> yeah, it's not real. We're using AI. Oh, his head I, is actually I think my Danny head. Miss your name. So it's Cali California. Um, my name is California Mist or Cali Mist. Yeah. Um, if you want to, you can add me on Facebook. Just C A L I space M I S T. I'm also the author of the holiday marijuana cookbook called uh, Cannabis Kitchen High Holidays, which is currently one of the best looking e-cookbooks uh, still available even though it was released several years ago so check that out so it's only available in the like e on amazon, amazon yeah okay. yeah awesome. i just wanted i just wanted to destroy the food network's cookbooks and make mine look better and be about weed so i'm sure they're better <laughs> than anything on the food network so uh thanks again for all oh, omg it looks real <laughs> awesome all right i will see you all next week there we go Oh, goodbye now. Goodbye now. It's just a moment.
apartment were apart. Bye.